on behalf of all my family, I can only offer the most sincere and heartfelt thanks for your condolences and support. They mean more to me than I can ever possibly express. And to my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this, thank you. Despite steady rain, thousands lined the A40 into central London from the west. On the other side of the road, they stopped, nose to tail, in the fast lane as the cortege came past. As they passed Marble Arch, the pavements on the western end of Oxford Street and down Park Lane were packed and silent. Rounding the Victoria Memorial in front of Buckingham Palace, the crowd was dotted with hundreds of tiny lights as people lit her way home with the torches on their phones. Her police motorcycle escort, their job done, stopped, heads bowed on either side. Inside the palace, her family were waiting to receive her. Children and grandchildren gathered for a last private evening before her coffin is taken in procession back into public view for the lying in state in Westminster Hall tomorrow afternoon. The death of a monarch has inevitable ramifications for the line of royal succession. Charles has been the longest serving heir apparent in British history. The former Prince of Wales has spent more than seven decades as heir to the throne. As Prince of Wales, Charles has defined the role of heir apparent. He has been called a visionary in his creative and forward-thinking ideas. Well, I think that the Charles, when he was Prince of Wales, he created a role for himself and he fulfilled it extremely well. You know, he earned the great, great respect of his parents because he was a very awkward, shambolic child, odd teenager, difficult, um, shy, um, but he had this, this real simpatico and warmth, and he, he won people over. Charles is president or patron to over 400 charities and organizations, and known as one of the most hardworking royals, alongside his sister Anne, the Princess Royal. It really is a great privilege to be with you today in my 40th year as your Colonel-in-Chief.
One of the gems of the Queen's reign is her involvement in and support of the Commonwealth, of which she is head, an important role also fulfilled by her late father. However, it is not a hereditary position. Prince Charles has shown his dedication to the Commonwealth cause for many decades, and in an important speech in 2018, the Queen expressed her wish that he will follow in her footsteps. It remains a great pleasure and honour to serve you as head of the Commonwealth and to observe with pride and satisfaction that this is a flourishing network. It is my sincere wish that the Commonwealth will continue to offer stability and continuity for future generations and will decide that one day the Prince of Wales should carry on the important work started by my father in 1949. As the longest serving heir to the throne in British history, Charles has had plenty of time to build and develop the role of Prince of Wales. He has focused on helping others and bettering the world around him for future generations as a leading voice in environmental causes, arts and culture, and architecture. There is no doubt of his ability to step into his mother's shoes when the time comes. Ladies and gentlemen, the battle against climate change is surely the most defining and pivotal challenge of our times. Even in a world full of daunting perils and crises, it is hard to imagine anything that poses a greater challenge and opportunity for humanity. We are running out of time. How many times have I found myself saying this over recent years? On the 8th of September, 2022, the news reported that the Queen was ill. Just after 12.30 today, we heard the news from Buckingham Palace that the Queen um, were concerned about the Queen's health. They said doctors were concerned and they told her to rest and she was under medical supervision. Buckingham Palace announced the Queen is under medical supervision, and one by one, members of the royal family raced to Balmoral Castle to see the Queen. But the concerning thing is that members of the royal family, her children, and William, the second line to the throne, grandchild, are all travelling up to Balmoral to see her as we speak. So that is the concerning thing, that the family feel that things are so serious that they need to be by the Queen's side at this moment. But the people didn't give up hope. Thousands of people gather at the gates of Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle in silent prayer for the swift recovery of the Queen. But their prayers fall on deaf ears. A single sheet of paper is carried by two footmen and hung on the gates of the palace. A short message printed upon it reads, The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. For decades, she has been the nation's anchoring force in a world in the midst of change. Now we are all alone, on moored without her. News reporters all reach for their black ties, kept in preparation for this very moment. Crowds swarm royal residences and stand in quiet vigil. 
St. James's Park is awash with color as thousands lay flowers in tribute to the late queen. Tears are shed and millions around the globe mourn the loss of a woman who had served generations as monarch. And so the reign of Elizabeth II comes to a close after 70 years at the age of 96. Her son Charles is now king. He has little time to grieve, as he has official duties to attend to. The following day, Charles and Camilla return to London. After greeting crowds at Buckingham Palace, Charles and Camilla walk through the Golden Gates as king and queen for the first time. I think that probably the shock of the mother's, his mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you, in a way. But at the time, you're in this sort of bubble, so I'm sure Charles was in a sort of bubble. He, he had his duty to do, and he, he was in shock, and it protected him. And then it, I mean, maybe he hasn't even had time to grieve yet. Charles makes his first televised broadcast as king, paying heartfelt tribute to his beloved late mother, Queen Elizabeth II. I think that Charles's very first broadcast as king to his people was extremely well thought out, extremely moving, and, and it was very measured, very careful. And um, Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. When the Queen came to the throne, Britain and the world were still coping with the privations and aftermath of the Second World War and still living by the conventions of earlier times. In the course of the last 70 years, we have seen our society become one of many cultures and many faiths. The institutions of the state have changed in turn. In the Commonwealth and across the world, a deep sense of gratitude for the more than 70 years in which my mother as queen, served the people of so many nations. In 1947, on her 21st birthday, she pledged in a broadcast from Cape Town to the Commonwealth to devote her life, whether it be short or long, to the service of her peoples. She combined these qualities with warmth, humor, and an unerring ability always to see the best in people. I pay tribute to my mother's memory and I honor her life of service. I know that her death brings great sadness to so many of you and I share that sense of loss beyond measure with you all. I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love as I have throughout my life. Unlike his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, Charles always knew he would one day become king and has held the title of Prince of Wales since 1958 and was formally invested by the queen a few years later. 
If you're the heir to the monarch, there's always a sense of preparation to become a king or queen. So I think there's absolutely always a sense that whoever is heir apparent is being groomed for the role from the minute they know that that's their destiny. The former Prince of Wales has spent more than seven decades as heir to the throne. Since the age of three, when his mother became queen after the sudden death of her father, King George VI. From the moment Bertie became king, Elizabeth was queen in training. George knew that his health was failing. He knew that he'd had cancer and he knew that he was unlikely to become an old man. So he knew that his, his daughter Elizabeth would have to become queen at some point before she was ready for it. When Princess Elizabeth received the news of the death of her father, she went into shock, as you would. I mean, she was shocked by his death because she thought he was getting better. Everybody within the family thought the king was getting better. He was at Sandringham, he'd been out shooting, he'd had a wonderful day, he was with friends. And as Princess Margaret said in much, much later in an interview, he died just as he was getting well. But of course, he wasn't really getting well. They thought he was. So it was a huge shock to her. And it, it meant the end of her life as she knew it. She had two little children. Uh, a naval husband, uh, and they just started out, really, on their married life. And they just moved into Clarence House, which was their first real home. And you know, like, and, and he was going to be posted to Malta. Their life looked really rosy, and suddenly, basically, it ended. You don't want to sentimentalise these things because you don't want to make it look as if it's, you know, a heartbroken queen. But she was a relatively young woman, recently, recently married, and she lost her father. And in addition to personal loss, she knew she was going to have to become queen. I think that was an incredible moment because you know at that stage that you've got to change your entire life and you'll never have your own life again. In a palace built by Henry VIII, a ceremonial event heavy with history. The first time in 70 years this country has proclaimed a new monarch. The first time ever all of us, via television cameras, have been allowed to follow the great and the good in. In the first part of the council, the chosen privy and accession councillors gather at St James's Palace to proclaim the new sovereign. The cabinet post, now held by new leader of the Commons, Penny Mordaunt, announced the demise of Queen Elizabeth II, while the new king waited in the adjoining room. My lords, it is my sad duty to inform you that Her Most Gracious Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, has passed away on Thursday, the 8th of September, 2022. She then calls upon the clerk of the Privy Council to read the accession, which is then signed by those present. Then, with the arrival of the King, the second part of the Council begins. Do now hereby, with one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late Sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. The new king then holds His Majesty's first privy council. Queen Camilla and Prince William accompanied Charles as witnesses to the ceremony. The king makes his declaration, swears an oath of fealty to the Protestant faith and to Parliament, then reads and signs an oath to uphold the security of the church in Scotland and approve orders in council which facilitate continuity of government. I take this opportunity 
to confirm my willingness and intention to continue the tradition of surrendering the hereditary revenues, including the Crown Estate, to my government for the benefit of all, in return for the sovereign grant, which supports my official duties as head of state and head of nation. With papers signed, oaths made, and declarations completed, the ceremony ends with those gathered offering an exultant, God save the king. God save the king. God save the king. An hour later, thousands of record buttons were pressed on phones and cameras as the Garter King of Arms emerged onto the balcony overlooking Friary Court in the palace, followed by the Earl Marshal, other officers of arms, and the sergeants at arms. Below them, a burst of royal guards and in ceremonial red, stand rigidly in a medieval display of pomp and pageantry. The genealogist David White publicly announced to the crowds gathered below that King Charles III is now sovereign. Outside the royal court, the state trumpets sound. Before rolling news, the role of this part of the ceremony was to spread the word to a waiting nation. Well, it was a huge privilege to be there because this, this event has happened in one form or another since Anglo-Saxon times. So you felt you were part of uh, an extraordinary historical event. This is a ceremony with roots dating as far back as the feudal era of Anglo-Saxon England. The Anglo-Saxon councils chose a monarch from a lineup of eligible royal males who was elected to be the next king. The first modern accession council dates from 1603 following the death of Elizabeth I, when the Scottish king James VI also became James I of England. During the proclamation of Edward VIII in 1936, the new king looked on in horror. He did not want to be king, as he found the restrictions of being monarch and the day-to-day -day governments that came with it rather chafing. Please, Lord Edward VIII. <clears throat> God save the king! He was enormously popular with the people. He was somebody who was seen as a completely different kind of king to every other, because he was seen as somebody who was very accessible. And the glamour that he'd had as, as a younger man persisted. There was a real sense that he was the first king who had ever really come down to the level of the public. God save the king! He was the least suited man ever to have been king. And the fact that people were desperate for him not to be king suggests that it was well known way, way in advance of his accession that he was not the right person to ever have become king. But overseas, three kings occupied the British throne in a single year. King George departs, beloved after 25 years of rule. And walking behind his coffin in the sad procession is the new king, who was the beloved Prince of Wales. Well, when his father died, he, he, he greeted his father's death with absolute hysteria, and he was throwing things around and shouting and unable to respond to it. And I think a lot of people thought this was a very bad omen of what was to come, and they were proved right. London acclaims the new king, and crowds gather for the proclamation. God save the king! <laughs> But even while the proclamation still rings, Edward stands beside Mr. and Mrs. Simpson in the windows of his apartments at St. James Palace. Soon he is to tell the world of the woman I love and for her renounce the throne. I mean, for the public, his abdication was a rejection. It was an utter shock. It was a betrayal. They were genuinely pained by this. I think it was devastating for the public. Then comes the year's third king with his Scottish wife and their two children, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, and the little Princess Elizabeth, who may one day be queen. George VI, or Bertie, as he was known, was absolutely terrified at the idea of becoming king. It was something he'd never wanted. 
Bertie, his brother, was completely and utterly devastated and derailed by the abdication. And so he was looking at his brother and begging him not to abdicate. He wanted to have a quiet, blameless life as a husband, a father, somebody who was a royal prince who stammered his way through speeches he had to give, but he never, ever wanted responsibility of actually ruling. He was the absolute antithesis of his brother. His brother was sophisticated, glamorous, dashing, confident, good with people. Here was Bertie, anxious, stuttering. He had a debilitating stammer, which meant that any kind of public speaking was nearly impossible for him. So when he became king, it was with an almost impossible set of expectations. How on earth do you follow somebody who has not just been this popular, trend-setting figure, but who was given up before and abdicated? I mean, how do you follow that? By the end of his reign, thanks to his unwavering rule during the chaos of the Second World War, King George VI was a very popular monarch. The proclamation of Elizabeth II was tinged with sadness following the sudden and saddening death of her father, the popular King George VI. Charles himself would have witnessed these ceremonies, knowing that one day he would have to repeat the same steps once his mother, the Queen, had died. And now the Palace of St. James, the center of the Commonwealth, London. The heralds come out, the court officials of Great Britain. Watching is the man who has shaped so much of our destiny. Here, with the Earl Marshal of England, the Duke of Norfolk watching, the ancient formula is carried out. The sovereign to be is proclaimed by Garter, King at Arms. Well, it hath pleased Almighty God, whereas it has pleased Almighty God, to call to his mercy our late Sovereign Lord, King George VI of blessed memory, to call to his mercy our late Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth II of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown is solely and rightfully come to the high and mighty princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We therefore, the Lords spiritual and temporal of this realm, being here assisted with these of His late Majesty's Privy Council, with one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. The overwhelming feeling, I think, was one of continuity. Uh, we mourn Queen Elizabeth II for her extraordinary reign and all her amazing talents. But seamlessly, you go straight to the new king, to Charles III, being sworn in in that very public but very old-fashioned and historical way and that overwhelming sense of the continuity of our constitutional monarchy and democracy um, which we should be very proud of by the grace of god of the united kingdom of great britain and northern ireland and of his other realms and territories king head of the commonwealth defender of the faith to whom we do acknowledge all faith and obedience with humble affection, beseeching God, by whom kings and queens do reign, to bless his majesty with long and happy years to reign over us. 
given at St. James's Palace this 10th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2022. God save the king! And at the Royal Exchange, the glad tidings are announced. In the city that was so long an independent and powerful part of the realm. Hers by right of succession, the Princess Elizabeth has agreed to accept the crown and rule as queen. A short while later, the second reading of the accession proclamation is performed by the Clarenceau King of Arms, Timothy Duke, outside the City of London's Royal Exchange. The accession to the throne of a new monarch always brings with it sadness for the departed sovereign and a period of both excitement and uncertainty of the royal family. One voice and consent of tongue and heart publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. Once the proclamation is complete, the band of the Coldstream Guards performed the national anthem. God save the king is the phrase on everyone's lips as the ceremony ends. Three cheers for his majesty the king. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. The following day, gun salutes echo across the country, from Edinburgh to Cardiff, London to Belfast, as local proclamations are made. God save the king. God save the king. And so it was. Moments like these years in the planning, still unfolding eight days on from the Queen's death. The streets around Llandaff Cathedral in Cardiff were packed, 64 years on from his first visit to Wales, in an era when they still used to sing, God bless the Prince of Wales. Around the world, more proclamations are made, declaring Charles III the new king. This is the first step on the long road to his coronation. In the days following his mother's death, King Charles, accompanied by Queen Camilla, visits the different nations of the United Kingdom and is warmly welcomed for the most part. Oid board and the wizog Cymru more here. An hour bead for Mab William and Durbin a title. My Ganzo Ev Gariad Dubn at Gumri. That ancient title, dating from the time of those great Welsh rulers like Llewellyn Ap Griffith whose memory is still rightly honoured. I now pass to my son, William, whose love for this corner of the earth is made all the greater by the years he himself has spent here.
Before the King flew to Scotland this morning, both Houses of Parliament had gathered in Westminster Hall to present their addresses of condolence and loyalty to the new monarch. Much of the ceremony and procedure that's followed the death of the Queen is ancient, albeit unseen for seven decades. This one is new. In the past, such addresses would have been presented in private. Members of both Houses of Parliament gather here to express our deep sympathy for the loss we have all sustained in the death of our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth. We have seen that this is a loss that has felt around the world. Deep as our grief is, we know yours is deeper. In the very hall where an earlier Parliament had put an earlier King Charles on trial for his life, the King spoke of the inextricable link between Crown and Parliament in a constitutional monarchy. Parliament is the living and breathing instrument of our democracy. That your traditions are ancient, we see in the construction of this great hall. While very young, Her Late Majesty pledged herself to serve her country and her people, and to maintain the precious principles of constitutional government which lie at the heart of our nation. This vow she kept with unsurpassed devotion. She set an example of selfless duty, which, with God's help and your counsels, I am resolved faithfully to follow. In this very hall on Wednesday, the Queen's coffin will be brought to lie in state for the four days leading up to her funeral. It will be a chance for hundreds of thousands to file past and pay their respects. Well, there were so many moving moments for Charles, but the first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it. Um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God save the king. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. The King's coronation is announced and will take place on May the 6th, 2023. This is the first coronation in a generation. The ancient ritual full of pomp and ceremony will certainly be a sight to behold and Charles and Camilla will be crowned King and Queen. Well, as far as I understand, the coronation will be a lot shorter than the Queen's, in keeping with the times. I don't think anyone would have the patience to watch three hours of coronation uh, it, it, this, day, this, this day. So I think it will probably be, be just over an hour. It'll be smaller and it will be cheaper, which of course is very important. But I still think it will have the pomp and circumstance that Charles loves so much, and we all love so much. Um, everybody was just saying how beautiful the, the, the Queen's funeral was because of 
that unity of, of military and horses and soldiers and precision that we have, and the coronation will be very, very much part of that. The throb of excitement grows, for within the palace, the Queen prepares to ride to Westminster, and now to herald her, the trumpets ring out. Well, the coronation of the Queen was a huge and very significant affair. It was a three-hour ceremony. It was, everybody recalls, the coldest June day that had ever happened. And it was pouring with rain. We won't ever have a ceremony quite like that again. Since 1066, every coronation of British monarchs has been held at Westminster Abbey. During this centuries-old initiation rite, the new monarch enters the abbey wearing a crimson surcoat and takes their rightful place on the chair of a state. The archbishops move around the coronation theatre from the east, south, west and north while calling for the recognition of the sovereign. They then swear an oath and are anointed with holy oil while the choir sings the traditional coronation song Zadok the Priest in jubilation. Then, St. Edward's crown is reverently placed atop the head of the new monarch. Cries of God save the king or God save the queen reverberate around the abbey. George VI's coronation was initially planned for his brother, Edward VIII. This was the first time in British history that a king had been crowned while the previous monarch was still alive. The then Princess Elizabeth could not have known that she, only 16 short years later, would be partaking in the same coronation ceremony. Day draws to its close. I know that my abiding memory of it will be not only the solemnity and beauty of the ceremony, but the inspiration of your loyalty and affection. I thank you all from a full heart. God bless you all. In turn, Queen Elizabeth's son, Charles, at only four years old, witnessed his mother's coronation in 1952, a prescient projection of his own fate. 70 years later, King Charles will take part in the same ceremony as his mother, grandfather, and great-grandfathers partook in. And looking from the sidelines, Charles's own son, Prince William, will stand witness to the moment that the crown of St. Edward is placed on his father's head, knowing that one day, he too will bear its weight upon his brow. <laughs>